everyone. Welcome to our latest edition of Eli on Air, the Eli Talks live stream broadcast where we come to you and share uh, great stories and great ideas from interesting folks from across the Jewish spectrum, all about Jewish religious engagement, Jewish literacy, and Jewish identity. My name is Miriam Berceau, and I am the Eli Talks Program Director. I'm thrilled and honored to be here today with Ilana Kaufman, who will introduce herself momentarily. Um, but thank you all for joining us for this really important and timely conversation about race and racism and the future of the Jewish community. Ilana gave a beautiful talk. She'll say more about that in just a moment. And uh, this conversation is a, a follow-up to the, the groundwork that she laid with that. So thank you all for joining us for that. Um, and I'd also like to give a huge thank you to the Haas Fund, who were our partners in production of Alana's talk, and we're really grateful to them for their work on this and all of the wonderful things that they do. Um, so thank you so much to the Haas Fund for their support of this work. Um, so uh, we'd love to hear your questions throughout the course of the conversation. Feel free to submit them in the Facebook group where you, Facebook event rather, where you likely found out about this conversation or share them on Twitter using hashtag Eli Talks, E-L-I Talks. And we will keep tabs on those throughout the conversation and answer them as they come up. Um, and in the meantime, uh, we'll just get started and jump right into this great conversation with Alana. So Alana, thank you so much for being here with us today. Such a pleasure. Thank you all so much. And um, I can't see any of you out there, but hello and good afternoon, good evening. And if you're on the other side of the globe, maybe good morning or good night. Um, my name is Alana Kaufman. I am the Public Affairs and Civic Engagement Director for the Jewish Community Relations Council in San Francisco, California and the Bay Area. And um, it's a really a privilege to be with all of you today. I want to talk a little bit about, I'm going to talk a little bit about my Eli talk, um, about who counts and doesn't count or who gets counted in the Jewish community. I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the Black Lives Matter movement and racial justice and sort of where our points of alignment um, are for our community um, and racism and the importance community want to be involved in these, your synagogues, um, and really expanding our Jewish world to be much more inclusive of all. Um, I also Oh, Alana, your, your audio seems to be going out and your video has frozen. Um, so if you can hear me, maybe you want to just close out and re-enter the Hangout by opening up that link one more time. We'll ask our viewers to be to be patient and supportive as we just work through an unexpected tech glitch. Just a moment. So for those of you who may be just joining us, we're getting Alana back into the call, but um, we're going to be speaking with Alana Kaufman, who gave a beautiful Eli talk about race and racism and the Jewish future. You can check that out and a bunch of other talks that we've just released at elitalks.org. Okay. All right. Miriam, do you want me to close out? You want me to close out and start again? I... Oh, we've got you back. I think you're all set. Okay, where did we lose me? All right, you, you were, uh, why don't you start with just a little bit about your talk? Okay, um, so. Do you want me to go on a hard wire? Um, this seems to be, let's try this connection and. Okay. We'll, so the structure and focus of my talk was really designed to create a structural argument about the importance of recognizing, first of all, the power of being in the group that gets to decide who counts and who doesn't count. And it was really important for me as a Jewish community professional who is privy to all of sort of the research and data about who is in the Jewish community, it struck me how important the dynamic between power and privilege is when you are the counter and when you are someone who gets to be counted if you count. 
And that structure has lots of historical reference points for us as Jews. We see that originally in Bamid Bar, when counting had a very specific purpose, which was, you know, as I share in my talk, to kind of identify who the Jews are. And it gives us a little insight into who kind of matters and who counts at those specific historic moments. And let's jump all the way to 2013 to the Pew study. And again, we're, we have a, a very powerful tool designed to make sense of who counts in the Jewish community, and then by way of omission, um, who doesn't count. And I was really, really struck by the power of that, and then what happens once someone is counted or not counted. Mm -hmm. And um, this structure of, of identifying who is part of the Jewish world also identifies who gets excluded from the Jewish world. And you know, my hypothesis is the Jewish world is going to be much more racially and ethnically diverse in maybe 10 and 20 years. And if we don't change, first of all, the dynamics about who has the power to count, who informs who gets counted, who gets counted, and what we do with that information, um, I think we're going to, we're going to lose our, you know, big parts of our Jewish community. I think we're going to push away from the Jewish community, Jews who want to be fully engaged and participate and we are going to relegate the Jewish community to a particular swath who might look like white Ashkenazi Jews when that in no way reflects the reality of who's in the Jewish community. And then I wanted to be able to sort of um, propel that entire frame and, and, and way of thinking into really talking about the experiences of Jews of color, racism in the Jewish community, and um, why it's important to, to really talk about things in a complicated intersectional way, um, in a way that the community can lean in and be in partnership and dialogue. Mm -hmm. Great. So for anyone on the call on this in this conversation who hasn't seen the talk, I highly re recommend that you check it out. Um, watch it with your colleagues, have a conversation about it. It's a really powerful piece to, to take a look at. And um, Ilana, one of the biblical points of reference that you use in the course of your talk is this story of the daughters of Zilochad. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if you can say a little bit more about that reference point. And, um, to what extent you you talk about this idea of a halakhic course correction, um, yeah. which I think is a great phrase, and um, so I'd love to hear you say a, a, a bit more about that, and in what ways can that story act as a model for for working towards and achieving racial justice today, and where perhaps does it fall short? So I think that um, the way I interpret that piece of text. Uh, and you know, really looking at the first census in Bad Min Bar and the second census, the way I interpret it is that when there was a, an opportunity to, to evaluate losing Jewish land and name or expanding the Jewish community to be more inclusive so that the Jewish community could stay together, that there, there was really, I view it as a course correction because had the daughters of Zalefchad not, um, and I'm going to talk about a specific word they use, if had they not protested mm. and petitioned Moses and the priests, then they wouldn't have been heard. They wouldn't have had their protest considered. And really, quite frankly, Judaism would not look like the way it does now because either land and family name would have been lost, women would have been lost in some ways and the Jewish community would not have survived as we understand it. If you look at the Hebrew and the text, the, it is not that they requested mm. Moses and the priests in the assembly to consider a possible alternative to their current plan as you know expressed in, in the text. The word is petition and protest. And so I think that's instructive for us in the Jewish community that sometimes, um, and it doesn't mean that it's impolite, it doesn't mean it's aggressive, it doesn't even mean it's out of line. It means that sometimes we who have to create change and catalyze change in the Jewish community have to choose to petition and protest rather than request because a request suggests the response could be no. Mm -hmm. And a petition and protest compels the audience of that protest to understand that this is important in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we look at contemporary expressions of that, that tool, of petition and protest as Jews of color, as people who want to more deeply engage the Jewish community in racial justice work. Sometimes there's times where we should ask and sometimes there are times when we have to push or protest and nudge. And we see a successful example of that with the daughters of Zalef Chad 
And we also get permission to act in their spirit given the importance and the success of the protest found in that piece of text. And so I think it gives us tools, it gives us strategies, and it reminds us that protesting and petitioning is not only okay, it's halakhically, um, it's hectured, you know? And I think that's powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it also, there's something there also about the precursor to being counted as being seen, right? And so there's something about the daughters kind of approaching Moses and making themselves seen in order to petition and to protest and to bring on the change that was needed for that. That's right. And I also think part of that is, um, in my interpretation, there's an implicit assumption that there's no malintent on the part of Moses and the priests and the assembly. Mm -hmm. It's not that there's a malicious omission of the daughters of the left cod. It's that they haven't yet thought in that way mm -hmm. and they haven't been inspired to be more expansive in their thinking. And the tool of the protest inspires expansive thinking. And so we get to, we have to borrow that as something that's positive and passionate um, mm -hmm. and instructive in that way. Great. Yes. Um, so I'd like us to back up a little bit because the, there's another really key piece of your talk in which you, in which you address this equation of Jewish with white, um, which my understanding is, and this is this is my you know limited understanding of history is that white has always been kind of a malleable category, and Jews have not always been part of of that set yeah. and um, so I'd I'd love to hear a little bit about the the history of how Jewish kind of ended up being equated with white and what some of the um, what some of the implications have, of that have been for the community. Sure, sure. I mean, and I think that, um, so when our Ashkenazi brothers and sisters, my mom is an Ashkenazi Jew, I, my, 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 my context is an Ashkenazi cultural uh, context. When our families of Ashkenazi background came to the United States, they didn't come here with white privilege. They came here as people who were coming from Poland and Romania and other countries where they were received in the United States as people of ethnicity and in some cases people who were othered in ways that were reflective of being viewed as non-white. And um, many were running from persecution, uh, many came in poverty, and had the same sort of struggles that other communities of color have experienced in the United States. Not only that, our families came into um, sometimes labor contexts where they were put into labor situations that were not esteemed. Um, some worked in sweatshops. And so the context was very, very difficult. In the United States history, as we've moved forward, Jews who have Ashkenazi background have had to grapple with the marginalization, the oppression that they felt as people who are Jewish and people of ethnic backgrounds while also on a continuing upward mobile path that has led them toward um, toward being viewed as white in a U.S. context that's high, highly racialized. And so, I mean, I want to recognize that this context in the United States is very specific. We have a deep, deep history and pathology around race and racism in this country, and it pushes Ashkenazi Jews to have to grapple with their own history of marginaliz marginalization and oppression, their own identities as people of ethnicity and their own experiences as being marginalized as people of ethnicity, while at the same time, over the arc of time, especially if you look at like the 1960s to now, there has been tremendous gain and tremendous power and privilege achieved by white Ashkenazi Jews in this country. As a result, and within a context where people of color, meaning those without white skin privilege, while they have been, we have been further marginalized in this country, um, Jews with Ashkenazi background have had to grapple with the privileges that they've gained, the perception that their ethnicity is now white, and then the role that the privileges that come with that white ethnicity have within the context of a racial justice movement. And so a couple of things. Um, it's hard. When I, when I talk with our Ashkenazi, like our white-skinned Ashkenazi brothers and sisters, our sisters who have the, the, the privilege that comes with having that dual parental white Ashkenazi background, mm -hmm. there's a real sense of uh, what I hear is a sense of loss around their ethnic identity, mm -hmm. a sense of fear about if we give up that whiteness or that ethnic identity that's now interpreted into whiteness, that 
Jews will become washed into the mainstream and then, you know, the opportunities for losing identity and, and, and increasing anti-Semitism might increase. Um, and a loss of sense that Jews are not like other white people mm. and don't have the same privileges as other white people. And I think the challenge and the opportunity is to have to hold the reality of Jewish ethnic background alongside the reality of the privilege that comes from white skin background, and then the responsibility that is required with that white privilege vis-a-vis -vis racial justice in the United States. And it's complicated. Um, I appreciate that some Jews with that background don't identify as white, and I want to encourage the complexity of holding on to the ethnic identity while also recognizing and grappling with the privileges that come with the white skin, with, with the background and the privilege that comes with white skin. Hmm. So I think, um, so, the, so the part that you're, that you're talking up focusing on a lot, and the, the thing I'd like to touch on now is that, um, where does this leave Jews of color, right? So we've got, um, we've got uh, white Ashkenazi Jews who have this, this background that, you know, in addition to thinking about the, you know, going back to the Torah and thinking about slavery and using that as a point of identification with a, a lot of American, African Americans whose right. backgrounds come from that kind of, from that exact experience in an entirely different context. Um, but then as you, as you address in your talk, you end up with this, um, not only this equation of white equals Jewish or Jewish is white, um, rather, but also that you know, black folks can't be Jewish, that there, that there are no Jews of color. Um, so where does this bifurcation leave Jews of color? And what's, can you say a little bit about that experience? Sure, I mean, so one other, one other piece of background is one of the reasons why Ashkenazi Jews washed into the white world, if you will, is was a strategy to assimilate. And so it's it's not it should not be viewed as a failure that Jews became white. For some, it's actually a real example of success because it shows how well Jews assimilated into the United States culture and kind of the white world and the white culture. And so part of that strategy of assimilation created a narrative that all Jews were white. Part of that strategy for assimilation also elevated uh, community leaders to create sort of a communal approach in the United States that reflected their own community. Part of that also was like, I'm pretty sure when, you know, when my grandparents were immigrating, I'm pretty sure they didn't imagine that my mother was going to make children with a black person. You know, like, I'm just pretty sure that that was not on the set of assumptions that some of our, our grandparents and great grandparents, you know, were, were processing at the time. Um, and so, you know, in some ways, this is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of newness in terms of, of projecting forward who would be in the Jewish community and then planning in a, a head based on mm -hmm. what those projections would look like. So you fast forward and, you know, our colleagues at Behol Shon will tell us that, you know, approximately 20 percent of racial of Jews are racially and ethnically diverse in the United States. And that's an old statistic. And so I have to believe there may even be more. And what we've done is we have this kind of delta. Let me say one other thing. You know, the attraction of the organized Jewish world to just the diversity of Jews in the United States has been challenged. And so, you know, in general, we have fewer Jews participating in synagogue life, going to Jewish day schools, working in mainstream Jewish organizations. And so we have a context where our mainstream Jewish organizations uh, reflect pretty much who they work with, which are for the most part white Jews. And we have a Jewish community in the United States that's filled with all kinds of Jewish diversity, uh, LGBT Jews, Jews of color, Jews of different, you know, um, abilities and we haven't effectively brought all of those community members in in a way that's just authentic and intersectional where the space welcomes everyone come as you are do your thing we're all jews together what makes the experience of jews of color unique is that we have racism and you know in the united states we systematically teach people to be afraid of people of color in the United States, we systematically teach people to make assumptions about people of color. 
in the United States through media, through educational tools, through the prison industrial complex, through all kinds of systems and structures, we reinforce the idea that people of color, especially those of us who have brown and black skin, are in some way predetermined to a destiny that is other than um, being whole, thriving, and really accessing our personal power to be great in who we are. We also have the reality of danger out there. And so specific to Jews of color, without intention, and I, and, you know, and I, I really believe that, the Jewish community has become very narrow in who it serves in a mainstream context. We've done a terrible job in the Jewish community of projecting to the world who the Jews are and the diversity of the Jews. And so we have reinforced, the Jewish community has reinforced stereotypes about the narrowness of the Jewish community. And we've done a terrible job preparing and training and um, educating our own community members about the diversity of who's in their world, about how to grapple with social justice issues just as people of values and doing it all together in an interconnected ecosystemic way so that the community grows and um, connects and engages together and moves forward together. Mm -hmm. And so the result is that our synagogues and our day schools and our mainstream organizations don't reflect the diversity of the Jewish community. Um, the results are that just like anybody in the United States, Jewish community members who are not people of color learn racist messages and express them unintentionally generally. Mm -hmm. And that our organizations and systems are set up to be somewhat exclusive um, and really serve folks who kind of fit a narrow, narrow notion of who's, who the Jews are. Mm -hmm. um, and so Jews of color have to grapple with wanting to engage in their faith, dealing with sort of filters of racism inside the Jewish community, and then all of that existing within the larger world that is filled with racist tension at this time. And it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, um, and uh, and I'll say it like there's there's points in your talk. You have several anecdotes, you know, stories, personal stories, and sharing others' experiences of these um, uh, moments of uh, microaggression, micro microaggressive expressions of racism. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, that's like shifting your seat, uncomfortable kind of stuff for um, for the mostly white audience that um, was at that Eli talks filming and for me because I you know to be perfectly you know plain about it like I, I hear those stories and I think god that's terrible and that's not me I, I would never do that you know um, right. and I think there's I think if we can take a moment just to talk about those the, the kind of levels or gradations on which um, on which racism and racial justice can be addressed and right. um, the, the levels at which it kind of plays out in a community um, right. Because I think it really is. It's a for a lot of Jews who feel that they are a lot of white light-skinned Jews who feel that they are committed to social justice that are that they see that as an element of tikkun olam and things like this. It's a really um, painful message to hear. And I think having a maybe having an understanding of the levels at which that plays out will help. Sure, sure. Them. You know, I mean, the first thing is like we have to we have to shift our assumptions about just who's in the Jewish community. And I was talking to a colleague the other day who said to me, you know, I grew up in an environment where there were only Jews who looked like me. And I actually never knew. I just never knew there were Jews who looked like you. Mm -hmm. And she was feeling some real deep feelings about that because she was like, oh, my God, I've missed a whole part of my community and my whole world. And so the first level is just like personal consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, the organized Jewish community has to project that level of consciousness out to the rest of our Jewish world. And what I mean by that is like, if we are raising our, our, our community to believe that there's only one kind of Jew, then they don't have much of a chance of having an expanded sense of who's in the world. Mm -hmm. And so the first level is those who have the Jewish community where the power lies, like the resources lie to affect change have to find it entirely compelling to tell the truth about who's in the Jewish community. Because what's at stake is so much worse that sort of confronting the fact that the Jewish community is diverse and there are black people in it and brown people in it and Latinos and Asians and native brothers and sisters, that's the first thing we have to do is have more comfort with the fact that the Jewish community is diverse than discomfort 
with the fact that it's diverse. The second thing we do at that personal, then we have to go into sort of how do we affect change within our, our, our personal spheres, our families, our synagogues, the places where we move in and out as whole people. Mm -hmm. And that comes from, again, like the consciousness, who's in my synagogue, who are my clergy, who's in my family structure? Do I have any friends who don't look like me? Do, I, do we have people in our community who don't look like us? And if we don't, let's not like default to let's, you know, like I had someone say to me like, well, we adopted a bunch of, like our synagogue has a family that adopted seven Ethiopian Jews. Like that's not, that's not like the flagship way to deal with community racism. It's like, what's keeping diverse Jews in general from your organized space or your community space or your family space? And what's getting in the way of you being in connection and reaching out? Um, we have our sort of organizational levels, which is, you know, if we have mainstream Jewish organizations that don't have any racially or ethnically diverse people in there, there's a structural problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, it's this particular part of the problem is not a touchy feely problem. It's a little bit like, you know, a library book is missing from the library. You go get another one. And I don't mean like you just go get a Jew of color, but, you know, if you're hiring practice, this is just good diversity work. This is just good inclusivity work. If you're hiring practices, the, the values of your community, the culture of your organization only attract one kind of person, then there's a structural organizational problem in there. And there are lots of like design thinkers and systems thinkers and diversity, you know, strategic planners who can help you fix that. And you come up with like a strategic plan to evaluate your hiring practices and systems. Um, the culture of your organization, is it welcoming? Um, and you sort of figure out ways to embed those processes into the work of your organization, your synagogue, your day school. A very quick real example. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a colleague in, I wanna say February, who's an executive director of a Jewish organization who called me because they had a, a young man of color who's Jewish, who came to work angry about one of the slayings of one of our black brothers and sisters here in the United States at the hands of police brutality. And the executive director didn't like that this young man brought his emotion into work that day and wanted to ask me if there was a, a tactful way to, to tell him to kind of park his emotions. I said to this executive director, like when things happen in Israel, or like when you experience anti-Semitism and you come into work all hot and upset about the issues or you're, the rest of your staff comes in, do you tell them to check their emotions at the door? Do you check them, tell them to park their perspectives and their anger at the door? And he said, no. And I asked him a little bit about why that is. And so right there, that's racist. Like privileging the expression of anger for one group and allowing them to be whole while wanting to subdue the emotions of a young African-American Jewish male who has every right to be angry and talk about it in his Jewish context. So we also have to find ways to, to, to communicate when we're not, we're not creating open and equitable spaces um, to talk about these issues in organizational structures. And then in the bigger picture, you know, I think about all of the leadership organizations and efforts across the continent to support developing Jewish leadership. And I think about, um, my goodness, like if these are supposed to be cultivating and building the leaders of the future, then we have to project 20 years out and think about who our Jewish community is going to be and literally develop great leadership programs that talk about the intersection of social justice themes that allow intersectional, multicultural Jews and diverse Jews to be whole and engage in leadership work. And we have to let them speak freely along with our, our white Jewish colleagues. Like we have to work collectively and um, un, in an unfiltered way around developing leadership skills, communication skills, multi uh, education, multicultural education and diversity skills and strategic planning skills. And we have to mash them all together to create new pathways and we have to bring resources to it and we have to sort of bring a lack of um, self-consciousness to it and we have to give permission permission to people to be whole and speak freely awesome so let's take a moment and dream big right, at, right. The end of the, <laughs> at the end of your talk um you have another one of my favorite phrases you talk about um developing a continental strategic plan um which on the one hand like 
getting the Jews to do a continental anything would be amazing. <laughs> especially around this at this time, at this time in American history, where there is this bigger consciousness rising, where there is the, you know, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and and all of its related offshoots and um, and where there's there's this is in the air in, yeah. in the country regardless, and it's some it's it's a great opportunity with the high holidays coming up and. Um, thinking about our own cheshbon nefesh, right? Our own accounting of our own souls and things like that. Um, this is a, a great time, I think, for us to be thinking about counting and who counts and this issue of race. It all seems to be coming together. And um, so tell me about this continental strategic plan from your personal point of view. If, yeah. if, this, were, if this were implemented and if it were wildly successful, what would that look like? What kind of community would we, we be living in? I mean, since you've given me permission to think big, um, <laughs> I mean, a couple of levels and layers. I mean, at the sort of big, big community continental infrastructure layer, I would bring together our philanthropists. I bring together our activists. I bring together our leadership developers. I bring together our spiritual guides, our clergy, our, our, our clergy trainers. Um, you know, like our Hillel, like our sort of amazing young people, and like I would bring them all together to do like an inventory of community resources. Hmm. Because we have we have our philanthropists who have, you know, dollars. We have our leadership trainers that have knowledge. We have our activists who have insight and sort of skills and know-how. Um, we have our young people who have vision. Um, and who have a lack of filter that we, I'll speak for myself as an older person, I, I filter still. Um, and so like I would bring together all of the constituents and the stakeholders to do an inventory of our resources and an inventory of our needs. And then you match needs and resources. And so we attend to this on a spiritual level. We attend to this on a training level. We attend to this on an educational content level. Like I'll tell you, when I was in Sunday school, no one told me there was Palestine. And I remember being 19 years old and at a job where I met a woman from Palestine and I felt like an idiot when I could not comprehend what she was talking about because I had not been taught this concept. Mm. And like, that's just no way to live in the world. And that's no way to train Jews in the world. And so, you know, we train at every level and then I would set goals and objectives. And the goals and objectives would be about sort of what do we want our community to, to feel like? What do we want our leadership to look like and be like and act like? Um, what do we want to be able to do? If being a, if, if Jew was a verb, what would we want our Jews to do in the world? And how would we want to conduct ourselves? And then, you know, like I would wave my magic wand and we'd start to roll out a plan, you know? And so some of this, requires, you know, sort of deep reflection, but some of this just requires action. And we have to sit at the intersection of action and reflection and push. And pushing is not, you know, and pushing, um, we have to give ourselves permission to push sometimes. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I, for one, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and would love to help make it happen. Um, Let's talk about, so we are coming up on the high holidays and we have this opportunity where the Jews are getting together and I've seen, I can't tell you how many Facebook posts I've seen from rabbi friends who have said, what do you want me to talk about at the high holidays this year? Yeah. What should my Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur sermon be? And crowdsourcing that, which in itself is fantastic. But um, I think the this issue of, of race and racism and racial justice and all of that is, uh, is on our radar, um, and this feels like a, a good time for a lot of communities to address it. So, um, how about initial steps? What are yeah. some What are some concrete, tangible? Like, I feel the 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 important the impact of of these little tweaks that we can make along the way. Um, kind of steps that either that synagogues or JCCs or um, independent minions, whoever it may be. Can think about in order to help build this this vision of this diverse, inclusive Jewish community that you laid out for us. Um, so I think about like the power of the shofar and the idea that when we blow it, the sound is to wake it, wake us up, 
to awaken and stir us. And I want to encourage everyone to like state that they are blowing their shofars to wake us up to racial justice and to say it in your synagogues and say it in your communities. And when you're blowing your shofar on the porch in the morning, say it out loud um, and change the physics of this conversation. Like we have to be active to change the physics of the conversation and change the physics of this year's high holiday season. And we have to actually say it and do it. So do things like that. Um, this is our time of repair and to reflect and to say out loud where we have fallen short. And I think it is really, really important with consciousness comes communication about that consciousness. And so I want to encourage all of us to make our repair and to say it out loud and to push our leaders to make that repair and say it out loud. Again, every time we take a step forward and we do this with a little bit of courage, it changes the physics of what's happening and it changes the dynamic. But we have to say it and we have to do it. Like we can't just think about it. And for those of us who are in leadership positions, and I think about our clergies and our community leaders and those who are leading our services and doing the thinking and the planning, we have to be courageous and step into it and say these things out loud. Um, once we do our repair and sort of our owning of, I think there has to be some expression of vision. Like we have to put some stakes in the ground about what we want our Jewish future to look like, what we want our Jewish today to, to look like. And we have to put words and language to that. Um, again, it's not enough just to, be, to say like, we care about racial justice. We care about racial justice because we want this world to look different in these three ways. And we should name the ways. And we should communicate that to our communities so that they have a tangible way to think about not only what it could look like, but maybe they can find their way in. Um, and then we have to create some action. We have to help people find their way in. Again, we have to sort of set a goal. Like, we want it to be different. And in a year from now, here's what I want. This is how I want it to be different. And we know if we fall short, it's okay. Like that's built in to our to, to, to what we get to do as Jews. But we also know we have to say it and we have to do it before we're allowed to fall short and have it be okay. Um, and so like there is kind of like a template as Jews for how we get to implement ideas like this. Um, we have some structures and some practices that hold us accountable to our commitments. And I think we should go bold and state our commitments around racial justice and see how we do. And then we also, last thing I'll say is, we need to ask our people who can support us to support us. You know, I, um, there are a lot of great people working on racial justice issues in the Jewish community. And there are a lot of great white people and Jews of color working on these issues inside the Jewish community. And we have to be able to ask each other for help. And we have to be able to ask each other for the resources we need when we don't have them. And so if we need uh, to borrow a facilitator, if we need to borrow a leader, if we need to borrow a piece of text, if we need somebody to fund an effort, we need to know who we can go to and we need to go and we need to ask. Um, and then at the end of the day, we just, like we need to make this all public. And what I mean by that is we need to talk about this. We need to let other people know we're talking about it because again, we have to disrupt the physics of inaction or the physics of being frozen and paralyzed by the confusion and the challenge, challenging nature and the discomfort that comes with some of this. Um, and the last, I already said I'd say the last thing, but this is really the last thing, find community. Like who are your people? Who's gonna help you with this? Who are your personal allies? Who's your team? Um, and you gotta like have a little team to roll with who will support you and it's not always going to be easy and it's not always gonna be elegant, um, but you need a team and it could be a team of two, um, but you need to have people. Absolutely. I'm all for people. Right. And so, I, so Alana, I don't want to take up too much more time. You've been so generous with your time and with your wisdom. And I know everyone who's watching really appreciates it. You mentioned this idea of, of Jewish as a verb, which I also really love. And I think it echoes this whole conversation about sort of moving to action and doing that accounting. Um, and there's, there's two different ways that Jews are referred to. We're, we're Yisrael, we're those who struggle with God. And we're Yehudim, which comes from the word moda, which comes from thankfulness. And so um, 
I want to thank you for helping us struggle with this and um, and embodying all of those qualities so beautifully. Um, we'll, as we wrap up this conversation, we'll also be happy to share a couple of resources. The Hola Shown is a great option. Um, there's there's other great organizations working on this issue, and so. Um, if, uh, Jews, Alana, Jews with all cues, Jewish Multicultural Network, talk to our colleagues over uh, April Baskin at the URJ, Jared Jackson, Yavila McCoy. Um, I don't mean to forget anybody out there. Email me. We have colleagues across the country, um, uh, Jews for Racial Justice. Um, there are colleagues at JCRC, Ben the Ark. And so um, everywhere you are, you have people. Great. I think it's an amazing message to end on. We'll share some of those resources in the section below this video. So feel free to check those out, click on them, get in touch, find your people and make things happen. And most importantly, thank you. Thank you, Alana, for sharing your talk and for being here with us today. Thank you to everyone who has been watching and engaging in this conversation for all the work that you do. Um, and Shana Tova, everybody. Let's make it a great one. We've got a lot of work to do, but um, there's a lot of great opportunity out there as well. So um, with that, we'll see you next time at Eli Talks. And thank you again, Alana. Thank you all. All right. Happy Take New care. Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Thanks, everyone. Shana Tova.